Y'all, people in 2024 have gotten soft and sensitive and being a boss in 2024 is a nightmare. And I'll give you an example. Like me as the boss, if I made it a mandatory company policy that you have to naked sauna with me and your coworkers, some people now are gonna say that's inappropriate. That feels like it should be illegal. When in reality, I'm just trying to set up my employees for success. And at this point, if you're going, Phil, you sound like a crazy person. Well, boy, did I get you hook, line, and sinker. And I gotta tell you about Spectrum Studios. Right, because they are in the news, not because they're currently developing a game that claims to be a mix of Life is Strange, Final Fantasy, Heart of Darkness, The Tourist, and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, which is kind of a strange addition at the end, but whatever. But rather, because the company's creative director, Jacek Pierkowski, he had, we'll call it, a very eye-catching back and forth with a narrative designer and writer on LinkedIn. See, because he offered her a potential job to which she replies, hey, you must not remember, we've actually already spoken before explaining. From what you said, you considered naked sauna sessions a part of work responsibilities in your studio. I told you, that's a deal breaker for me and we've called it a day. And understandably, a lot of people saw that and they were like, excuse me, what the fuck? Mandatory naked sauna sessions? Okay, Harvey Weinstein. But well, as it turns out, the game's main character will be a sauna master and will be in charge of performing in various saunas. Right, that's according to a Help Wanted ad for the studio, which explains that attending the sauna sessions is quote, not negotiable because the entire team needs to understand Understand the product. And as Pierkowski noted elsewhere, certain saunas are so humid that your towel will just get drenched in seconds, which could lead to a fungal infection. And so for those, he says that you should be naked with nudity optional for the dry ones. And with all this, when he was pressed on LinkedIn, he defended himself saying, my narrative girls had to go to sauna with me to come up with amazing script for proof of concept. Technically, it's possible to do it without it, but I absolutely adore the fact that they could use their sauna experience to write awesome scenes. I don't want to waste my time to explain the difference between Ruska Banya or dry sauna sauna, you have to feel it. With him then offering to even organize female-only events, and arguing that you wouldn't hire an engineer to build a plane who doesn't understand the physics behind planes. You know how going to school and studying physics is the same as mandatory naked sauna sessions with your boss and co-workers. Right, so understandably, you had a ton of people just absolutely lampooning this dude. With, for example, 8-Bit's lead recruiter getting a lot of attention for his post about it, writing, I saw a lot of shit in this industry, but this is the new low I did not expect. This shit is so wrong and so disgusting on so many levels that I can't can't even describe it. But yeah, what, what are your thoughts here? Are you in the this is creepy and disgusting crowd or are you of the, the mindset of no, it, it does make sense? And while you answer that, I'll say I got a, ahead of myself. Hey, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco show. Today, I actually started by jumping into it. The story is going to kind of set the tone for everything else today. So why don't you buckle up, hit that like button to let YouTube know you like these big daily dives into the news and uh, we'll continue to jump into it. And then in a disturbing update to yesterday's story about that AI porn bill, the news you might have seen today is there's now another celebrity that's being targeted with AI porn deepfakes, with the newest victim being Jacob Elordi. And to make this specific situation even more disgusting is that the deepfakes in question allegedly featured the body of a minor, with reports saying that the deepfakes combine Elordi's face with a pornographic video from a male OnlyFans creator who goes by the name of Gussie on his profile, with then that creator sharing posts on X confirming that the AI porn is from his video and claiming that he was 17 years old when it was recorded. And while NBC confirmed that he is now 19, of course that doesn't change the situation. But despite not only being fake and involving the the body of a minor, these deepfakes have still circulated wildly on X, which has also seemingly done a piss poor job to stop it all. With some reports saying posts on the platform had been viewed at least 3 million times, them finding 16 posts, including one that has over 1.7 million views alone. With that saying that out of all the posts, just one had a content label indicating that it may violate X's rules against abuse. And then MKBHD is a murdering monster and we now have the proof. Fisker has now declared bankruptcy and it is obviously just this one reviewer's <laughs> fault. I'm kidding. About the fault, not the, the bankruptcy. Because right, if you're not familiar with this latest situation or even Fisker, I'll, I'll explain. Right, Fisker is an electric car company that popped up seven years ago and went public a few years after that, right, raising over a billion dollars from investors. Right, people going, this is the next Tesla. And last year, they released its first model, the Ocean SUV. You know, you had people saying it has a lot of things going for it. Impressive range, great design, relatively affordable price tag. But then immediately, reviewers began finding flaws, especially with its software, which is where YouTuber Marquez Brownlee, aka MKBHD, comes in. Because back Back in February, he published a video titled, This is the Worst Car I've Ever Reviewed. The software in this car is very incomplete. No indication anywhere in any software what the solar panels are doing, how much energy they've generated at any point, nothing. Not sure I've seen a smaller mirror on a sun visor on a car before. There is no glove box. There's just another tray. Unfortunately, these outside two buttons are extremely easy to press by accident. This one will literally restart the song you're playing. I don't think I've started this car one time and not gotten some error 
on this screen behind me. Even little things like Bluetooth I've had an issue with in this car. And I've also had the driver assistance systems fail on me several times. You pull up to a hill, it will literally start rolling backwards if you take your foot off the brakes. It doesn't have brake hold. I press unlock. Sometimes it takes me two or three times for it to actually wake up and unlock the car. You could give me this car and I wouldn't want to drive it. With that video getting nearly 6 million views, Fisker's stock was tumbling. That kind of being the biggest domino in the, the online conversation of like, is MKBHD killing companies with bad reviews? Which just to be clear, I, I think is a bullshit argument. I think that MKBHD does have a lot of power, but he has rarely ever been the only person slamming products. I do not think he is someone that is excited to shit on things. And at the end of the day, the only responsibility reviewers have is to be fair and to look out for consumers. And so now with the news that the company has declared bankruptcy, we saw Brownlee responding to it, saying, I know everyone's commenting that I killed them, but truth is they were doomed long before any of my videos. It's sad news because we always need more competition in the EV space. And when you look into the situation, his argument is solid. But I mean, one thing, just as Fisker was heating up in 2023, the EV market was cooling down. They're seeing the growth and consumer demand slowing down drastically, and it caused the whole EV industry to hit the brakes on production, right? And that for a variety of reasons, cars being too expensive, interest rates being too high, EV infrastructure being too sparse. Main point is all electric vehicle makers had to cut costs and put off investments. So specifically for Fisker, that's not to say they didn't have issues of their own, right? It did, it definitely did, not only with its product as we saw, but also with finances. With its CFO saying it just didn't have the people it needed to stay on top of the organization's growing complexity as vehicles started rolling off the assembly line. So you had the company missing several deadlines to file its financial results with regulators. And it lost two chief accounting officers among other top executives in less than a month. Also, there were long delays and vehicle deliveries, partly because it had to build them in Europe and then ship them to the US. So Fisker actually ended last year having produced over 10,000 cars, but only delivering less than half of those to customers. But then in an attempt to fix this, it changed its sales model from selling to consumer directly to selling through car dealerships. But that also didn't work. So it temporarily halted production while trying another fix. With it starting talks with a large automaker over a potential investment in joint manufacturing deal, but that fell through in March. So then pretty soon after the New York Stock Exchange delisted its shares, causing it to default on a debt agreement with a key investor. And then as cash reserves ran dry, it laid off employees, shuttered stores and warehouses and tried to restructure its debt. But then that didn't work either. So after investors refused to sink more money into the company, Fisker finally threw in the towel, which notably is actually the second time one of Henrik Fisker's automotive ventures has gone belly up. So yeah, a lot more was going on other than Mark has bad. I know people love a simple story, but there's there were a lot of things at play here. And then yo, I gotta say, it has been very fun for me to learn how you guys are using your Seat Geek winnings. From comedy shows to festivals, our weekly Seat Geek $500 giveaway lives on and you beautiful bastards are crushing it. Also for the uninitiated here, Seat Geek is the number one rated live event ticketing app with over 28 million downloads and access to a wide array of entertainment to get you and a loved one out of the house. And my team's worked with SeatGeek to extend the $500 weekly giveaway. And if you haven't entered yet, just do it. I mean, next week's winner could be you. You just add code PDS to your SeatGeek account. You get $10 off and you could be one of our lucky weekly winners. It's $500 in credit towards any of SeatGeek's 70,000 events. And if you're new to SeatGeek, you can also add code Phil for $20 off your first purchase. But remember, SeatGeek vets can add code PDS, which gets you $10 off any purchase. And again, you will be entered for your chance at the $500 SeatGeek credit. No purchase necessary. Also, I mean, if you're interested in a chance to win a $1,000 SeatGeek credit, Daily Dip newsletter subscribers can earn double entry and double winning. So keep up with the PDS in your inbox and subscribe right now. And then I need to take a few minutes to, to clear something up because I've seen a lot of misinformation and just old fashioned confusion over the past few days. Because a lot of people have been saying a lot of things since coming across headlines saying things like House passes a defense bill automatically registering men 18 to 26 for draft. Or with a lot of people going, oh shit, pack up for war, boys. Or with a seeing TikTok, YouTube, and other social media blowing up with people sharing uh, World War III thoughts, sharing their draft dodging tips, voicing their concerns about whether Gen Zers are actually fit for war. Hell, there's getting a whole new wave of attention because Cardi B shared her insightful commentary on the subject. And all I want to say is to America, good luck with that. <laughs> These new loons are TikTokers, baby. These motherfuckers ain't going to fight no war. We're going to die. You won't die. Right, well, that's a fun video. One, I gotta say, I can't speak to Gen Z, but fucking, I know Gen Alpha will fight a war. My 10-year-old will absolutely drone strike some insurgents like he's playing a fucking video game and then be like, oh, well, they had no skibbity Ohio Riz or whatever the hell words they've made up. Main point being, if we can fight wars using iPads, America's taken over the world. But I digress, right? The thing at the center of this story is about a bill that was passed by the House. It's called Service Member Quality of Life Improvement and National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2025. Right, and a version of that bill actually gets passed every single year because 
every year, Congress needs to sign off on the military budget. And with that, the version of the bill passed by the House includes a provision to automatically register American men between the ages of 18 and 26 in the selective service system. And automatically is the key word there. Because you may not realize this, American men in this age group are already required to register for selective service. And in fact, most states automatically register men for the draft when they apply for a driver's license. With many states even already requiring eligible people to register in order to take out state-level student loans. And in fact, it is technically a felony not to register for selective service if you meet the requirement. It's punishable by fines or even a prison sentence already. Though a key thing with that is that people being prosecuted for that, it's almost unheard of nowadays. With actually the bigger concern here being a failing to register affecting eligibility for federal jobs, citizenship, and student financial aid. Now, of course, it is still true that the selective service system is basically a list of U.S. citizens who would be eligible to be conscripted into the military if needed. But a very key thing is that being eligible for a draft is a hell of a lot different than being drafted. And at that point, the U.S. military hasn't used the list of names to call people up for military service since the Vietnam War. And also, importantly, it's not something that can easily be done either. But the selective service system lays out a clear chain of events that have to happen before anyone can be drafted. With it most importantly, they're requiring Congress to amend the Military Selective Service Act to authorize the president to draft personnel into the armed forces. And, you know, if you watch this show, you already know how hard it is for Congress to agree on anything. Though also there, we still have to see if this version of the bill makes its way through the Senate. Because notably there, the House version includes other controversial measures. Or things like restrictions on abortion and transgender health care in the military. But with this, you know, I don't want to be completely dismissive. Right? Well, a draft is not seriously on the table right now. It has happened here in the past, and we live in a world where right now several European countries are talking about it due to fears of Russia. And I mean, some already have it. And then even here in the U.S., several former Trump officials and Republican lawmakers have talked about a national service mandate and other measures to deal with what they refer to as a crisis facing the country's all-volunteer military. In fact, Christopher Miller, who led the Pentagon near the end of Trump's presidency, said a national service requirement should be strongly considered, even going so far as to call it a common rite of passage that would create a sense of shared sacrifice among America's young people. Though also, to be fair, there you had Trump writing on social media that the idea that he would call for mandatory military service, that that was ridiculous. But hey, whatever happens, happens from here. But at the very least, I just wanted to share the reality of what's actually happening since uh, a lot of people are just kind of yapping. And it just feels like media literacy right now might be at a, an all-time low. To impart to the shock and share uh, economy that we have on social media and also the, the breakdown of, of trust on social media. I mean, less important story, but yesterday there were a lot of people that were like, wait, Justin Timberlake was on Molly and all these other drugs? And it seemingly turned out that the main source for that was Poo Crave, a satire account of Pop Crave. 126,000 likes on that. 24 million views on that post. And it took way too long to get a community note on that thing. We are doomed. And then, Boeing CEO just admitted before Congress that the company has retaliated against whistleblowers. Though key thing, he didn't say, yeah, we retaliate by killing those fuckers, but the admission was still super significant. Right? Especially because numerous whistleblowers have made these allegations since the whole door plug debacle. Right? And during his first appearance before Congress yesterday, we saw this interaction between Boeing's outgoing CEO, Dave Calhoun, and Senator Richard Blumenthal. Mr. Calhoun, let me ask you, how many of your employees have been fired for retaliating against whistleblowers? Um, Senator, I don't have that number on the tip of my tongue, but I know it, I know any, it happens. I know it happens. Firing? I am happy to follow up and get you that number. I would appreciate yes. your following up. Let me ask you, have any of your supervisors, your managers, anybody been fired for retaliating against people who speak truth to power about defects or problems in production. Senator, we have fired people and disciplined people. Right, and those comments are also notable because they came just one day after a new whistleblower came forward with allegations that Boeing failed to properly track faulty parts and may have even used them on some planes. With these new claims being made public in a 200-page memo released by the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations ahead of the hearing. And that document detailing a complaint made by an employee by the name of Sam Mohawk, who works as a quality inspector in the factory where Boeing assembles the Max. And according to the committee, Mohawk witnessed systemic disregard for documentation and accountability of faulty parts, aka non-conforming parts, or which are supposed to be closely tracked and carefully disposed of to ensure they don't get used in production. With specifically Mohawk claiming that when Boeing restarted production after 737 MAX groundings following the fatal crashes in 2018 and 2019, the company experienced a 300% increase in reports stating that parts didn't meet manufacturing standards. But then, instead of being removed and tracked, the report alleges that the 737 program was losing hundreds of non-conforming parts and adding, Mohawk feared that non-conforming parts were being installed on the 737s and that it could lead to a catastrophic event. And going even 
further, Mohawk claims that Boeing tried to cover this up by intentionally hiding improperly stored parts from the FAA during an on-site inspection, accusing higher-ups at the company of ordering the faulty parts to be stored outside after being informed of an upcoming inspection, resulting in 80% of those materials being hidden from the agency. And eventually, the sheer number of faulty parts became so overwhelming that Mohawk said that his superiors literally told him and others to eliminate or cancel the records that designate a part as non-conforming, a direction that significantly doesn't just violate Boeing's own rules, but also federal regulations. So all of this was so concerning that Mohawk decided he had to speak up. But when he reported the issue to Boeing's internal portal for employee safety concerns, his report was literally just directed back to the same managers he was complaining about. But that said, on the other side of this, Boeing, for its part, has responded to the new allegations by saying that it's reviewing the claims and saying in a statement, we continuously encourage employees to report all concerns as our priority is to ensure the safety of our airplanes and the flying public. And while that encouragement is uh, probably not genuine, it does seem like more and more whistleblowers are coming forward despite everything. Just last week, Bloomberg reporting that FAA data showed that the agency had gotten 11 times as many Boeing whistleblower reports just in the first five months of this year than in all of 2023. And reportedly, just between January and May, it got 126 whistleblower tips. The previous year, they got 11. And lawyers for whistleblowers have said that there are still around 50 people who want to share their safety fears even after the deaths of two informants. And then, finally, today, I want to end with a big thank you, and I also want to talk about yesterday. As far as a big thank you, thank you to everyone that made this week's beautiful bastard.com drop so big. We've still got a little left of something, so if you didn't get in, definitely get it now. But I was so happy to see that so many people really connected with this release. Especially because, like, if you haven't gotten stuff in the, the last, I'd say, two months, the quality of the cut, the comfort, the feel, like, it's just gone through the roof. So definitely go check that out. If you've been on the fence or you're thinking about it, now's the time. But then, as far as yesterday, let's talk about those comments. Because there was a lot of conversation around, is this guy a whistleblower or is he just some fuckhead who's violating HIPAA? And if you missed yesterday's show, you want all the details, definitely go watch that. But you had folks like Skywalker saying, if working 10 years in healthcare has taught me anything, it's not to fuck with HIPAA. Others responding, the amount of people who do not have a basic understanding of HIPAA is astounding, like who it actually applies to. And folks like Blue Shadow responding to that saying, right, and the whistleblower was a resident, literally spent four years of medical school getting that drummed into his head. And you had others chiming in saying, as someone who has worked in medical records for a hospital and is very familiar with HIPAA, I can say whether he redacted names or identifiers before passing them on or not, he is not supposed to be looking at a patient's record at all unless he is involved in their care. HIPAA insists on as few eyes seeing the patient's chart as possible, and that alone could make him liable. And also adding, there are numerous legitimate agencies which whistleblowers are encouraged to report to. Anyone who works at a hospital can confirm they're no secret, but posted everywhere. The fact this man went running to a conservative news outlet confirms his motives had nothing to do with, quote, protecting children and everything to do with riling up anti-trans, anti-doctor sentiment. But then the other big story that people were commenting on being the whole kick drama and the allegations. Some of the top comments there reading, are we really surprised the heads of kick don't care about the opinions of others when they host streamers committing crime and spreading misinformation and not punishing them in the slightest? With others responding there saying, I'm genuinely lost how the first girl thought kick was some respectful company. Right, others saying they're not surprised by this news. And then others specifically taking aim at XQC. He shared his experience, he defended the company, which resulted in comments like XQC asked kick about the cancer. They investigated themselves and found they did nothing wrong. XQC accepts that at face value. Shocker. With some replying, sometimes you just can't fix stupid, but also others saying he can be an airhead and a narcissist, but to be fair, he wanted to hear from other people than take shit at face value. But, you know, whatever your thoughts here or really with any of today's stories, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. And while you do or disregard that, I'll just leave you with, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you right back here tomorrow for probably the last show I'm gonna shoot in this room for a while.